actually, um, thank you to everybody for uh, joining this call. I can see the number of participants are going up. Uh, and a special thanks for pa the panelists. We had to put this, there's been very short notice to some of you because we, um, we wanted to get a time that fit a lot of schedules and especially ahead of parliament sessions so we don't lose people. Uh, so again, thank you very much for coming to this event. We will try and we'll, we will keep it at uh, no more than 90 minutes, uh, but we've got a lot of time for questions and you know just, just a, a good proper discussion kind of thing. Um, I also want to, well, in the interest of others on, uh, at the event, I know many, all the panelists know uh, of CPI and know what CPI does. Uh, in the interest of others in the, in the audience, CPI is an advisory organization with uh, and work climate change with a particular view on the financial aspects of climate change. Uh, CPI itself is a, is a little short of 10 years old, maybe about nine or so, was born with the intention of offering to governments, in particular at that time, uh, low carbon economic development plans that were financially feasible and for which uh, financial instruments slash innovative kind of financing was necessary. So about 10 years ago and the focus in India, which is perhaps about six or seven years in India, maybe a little bit less, uh, has been exactly that. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes on on very, very niche but with a financial uh, lens. Try very hard to bring the public and private sectors together, try very hard to bring uh, commercial and non-commercial together and see if we can blend it in. So this piece of work uh, for which we are, Jolly will make a presentation as well, is one of, uh, of the many things that are out there as far as climate finance slash green finance is concerned. Uh, one of the questions that's been coming that I've been hearing, I've been doing this, I've been in this business for almost two decades now in several roles internationally and I just got back to India last year, um, is how much green finance is there in the Indian economy? And this is a question that comes up and very often one has to go and either dig for numbers or you have to put some numbers together, but essentially there is no real one number that we're able to find. So that's, that's what got us uh, started uh, to see if we can do a little bit of a data gathering exercise. And Shakti Foundation has been uh, kind enough, I think, but more than kind enough, has been pioneering enough to see the need. And I'd like to definitely uh, recognize Shakti Foundation here. I'm sure it's just taken over. Uh, it's a really, really important, uh, uh, the Shakti Foundation plays a very, very important role in this business of renewable energy, climate, climate finance. So what we're presenting today is is essentially, you will see, but unfortunately not everybody can see because of this virtual reality we're at, uh, is, a, is a sum of exactly how much green finance went through the economy, what kind of sectors, what sort of instruments, and what does this data even look like? So we'll start with that. Uh, there will be a link provided for this report for those that want to download it. Uh, infographics can also be downloaded. Uh, and we'll start with perhaps two, um, we're very pleased and very happy to have Anshu Bhardwaj, the CEO of Shakti Foundation, who's recently taken over that position. And, uh, and of course, Dinesh uh, Jagdale, Joint Secretary and MNRE. Many of you probably also know Dinesh in uh, several other roles. Very, very pleased to have them here, including others on the panel, um, that I'm grateful to have Govind here, Govind Shankar Narayan. Um, each has, each of the panelists have a particular lens as far as green finance is concerned. Govind is one of the um, founders of eCube um, and he'll explain a little bit more through the course of the, of the event. Balwant Joshi is a dear friend, but Balwant is also one of the, one of the deepest minds as far as technical electricity sector, energy sector, power distribution sector is concerned. So when it comes down to some of the biggest roadblocks, Palwant has been there in this business for a very long time. Tramila Chavalia, many of you of course know, she's the main financial advisor in Railways. Tramila's had, um, she's, she did say that she was gonna come in and then perhaps leave very quickly because she had another meeting that just cropped up this morning. 
She has a lot, a lot of experience in public-private partnerships, in green finance, climate finance. So, you know, Shama has also been really great. We've been very grateful to have her here. Shloka is, um, I don't know if Shloka is here, but perhaps she'll come in as well. I'm here. I'm here. Ah, uh, hi, there you are, Shloka. Uh, Shloka has just started uh, a fantastic initiative, the Indian Climate Change um, Collaborative, a collaborative of bringing philanthropies together for climate. Uh, probably the first in the country to, to do this. So it's really fantastic to try and get the ecosystem. Darshan, um, Vignarana is with the UK Cabinet Office for COP26. Uh, the UK plays a very important role. Um, especially since we're all gearing up for uh, an event at, at the end of the year. Uh, Chintan, again, many of you know Chintan Shah. He's now the director of uh, uh, Technical Packers at IREDA. IREDA, again, has played a fantastic role over the years. And Chintan, in particular, I know, is very, very involved in sort of next generation of green finance. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to get Radeep Singh. I was hoping that we could get him at the last minute, but yet. He's on his way to Kashmir tomorrow morning um, and needed to be at other things. So we've got a really good lineup. And once again, I must thank all of the panelists and all of you for taking uh, this time out. So I, with that, I'll ask Jolly to, so Jolly will in about 10 minutes, um, will also make the presentation, but I'll ask uh, Anshu and, and Dinesh to come in. Uh, and then we'll have a, a, a small presentation by Jolly, so you can see the report, you can see the numbers, etc. And after that, we'll break into the panel. And I might just ask Dinesh and Anshu that please consider yourself also panel members. Uh, I've been at events where people that that do keynotes and opening remarks are not uh, are not sort of encouraged to be at the, at the panel. So you know, you're very much part of this uh, part of this story. So with that, I'll leave it. I'll give it over to Anshu. Um, all yours, the floor is yours, Thank you, Mahua. Thank you for inviting uh, to this webinar. And I congratulate you and colleagues, Jolly and CPI colleagues, for uh, this report on India's green finance landscape uh, by CPI. I'm happy that Shakti has been associated with this. As you said, I have just recently joined Shakti. But I did discuss with my colleagues in uh, Shakti Pustav and uh, who mentioned to me that there has been a long uh, background of Shakti working in this area with CPI. Uh, and this is thus a, a sequence of one more in that the chain of studies that we have done jointly with you in this area. I also uh, uh, would like to greet my fellow panelist, uh, Shri Dinesh Jagdale, Joint Secretary MNRE, and would like to extend my greetings to him and to other co-panelists on this in this event today. Um, I think it's a my very timely study in the sense that uh, we when the, we announced the NDCs, uh, the the there was always a question mark on well, and NDCs are great. They are reasonably ambitious, but they always hinged upon the availability of technology slash finance. So in every forum, we used to discuss, well, what exactly are we talking about? What are those specific technology or those specific finance needs? And we never really got to get a clear answer on what are the specifics? Uh, uh, what are the barriers, say, in technology? And where is the money best spent? I agree with you that there have been general projections, but not a clear answer of a one single number. Of course, the RE targets have been enhanced to 450, uh, which makes this question all the more important to estimate what those finances actually are. Um, in that sense, the study throws light on these very relevant and important questions. The, the main goals of this particular study were to establish baselines in tracking of the flows, use and establish MRV systems in ensuring their efficacy, how the money is being spent. Uh, I, the previous studies that we had done with the, in this area 
were used to define what constitutes green finance i think that was a good contribution because there was lack of clarity on what exactly is meant by green finance so that shared lot of uh, clarity on definition of green finance what is green finance and what is not green finance um uh, i congratulate you and your colleagues for the fact that you followed a good process in this study i did notice a very good consultative mechanism of interaction with all stakeholders in the policy community you i noticed um, I to get feedback of a large number of government stakeholders in parallel uh, you also constituted a group of experts to review the findings of your work and to get critical feedback from the experts so i i appreciate that that it adds to the rigor of the analysis at and it brings in transparency into your work uh, so that when it goes out in the public domain as it's going today it carries much more credibility uh, i think finally um, i think the three thing which i sort of appreciate about the work uh, was one it identifies and quantifies overall flows into the sector and compares them with what is required or what is desired so as to meet the goals that we have targeted so in that sense it benchmarks what is the actual quantum of money as compared to what is required to meet our clean energy uh, and climate targets second it provides a good sectoral breakup uh, for instance uh, what is the amount of money which is going into re vis a vis industry vis a vis transport or other sectors where clean energy is uh, is being deployed so it gives a nice sectoral breakup uh and as uh, i obviously it's a uh, no surprise that bulk of the share goes to re is no surprise because re has got the most attention in the last few years but it is good to quantify nevertheless and finally it talks about the type of finance for example the debt driven finance uh, what is the contribution of that as against other kind of fin uh, financing options so with those preliminary comments i'll stop i'm sure people are waiting to see the report and the main findings i'll rest my words here but i congratulate you jolly and your uh, cpi colleagues for this timely report and thank you very much for having us as part of today's event thank you very much anjan thank you anjan thank you for that uh, uh, and thank you for your especially kind words uh i i i I've, i've keep i've got some comments but i'll keep them till till we finish this round as well um let me ask uh, dinesh uh to say a few words uh, i had also asked dinesh to comment on uh the, the the larger chunk the largest chunk being renewables and he's in the the hot seat as far as the driving that is concerned Good afternoon, Mawar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, Anshu, and welcome to the uh, the Shakti initiative that you have been uh, you will be leading now. Uh, thanks. I think good afternoon to all participants uh, joining from India, and I see some of uh, the participants from the rest of the world. So good day to you all. Uh, it is a pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar uh, organized by CPI uh, on India's green finance landscape and. i once again congratulate the entire team for its first of kind research that you have been doing uh, which talks about landscape of green finance in india tracking the green investment uh, flows measuring both public and private sectors uh, as well as the private sources of capital of uh, in india so ladies and gentlemen uh, it's my pleasure to be here amongst you uh, i will be uh, blessed enough to really listen to the uh, the stalwarts who are present here but Uh, nevertheless uh, i would like to present few thoughts uh, that i felt and also give you the background uh, of mnre uh, what steps you have been taking where are we in, in fact today most of you are aware but it's still to take a recap of all the situations around so i think uh, decarbonization in an attempt to uh, decarbonize our, our electricity matter electricity mix uh, is an important part towards achieving the sustainable goals development goals 
we are aware that uh, india has been increasing the share of re in its electricity mix reducing the emissions intensity by adopting to various measures which is large grid connected solar parks wind parks or re projects enhanced energy efficiency measures across sectors uh, decentralized re as well as electric vehicles and if you will really look at the last 5 years india has witnessed the highest rate of growth in the re uh, capacity addition uh, renewable deployment has doubled during these years with maximum share of solar pv uh, during the off, uh, during the recent years more renewable energy capacity is being added each year in india compared to the addition of fossil fuel based thermal power and uh, one of the report that i was reading bloomberg uh, talks that india's renewables are one of the cheapest in the world and uh, the speed at which india attained universal electricity access universal electricity access is unprecedented in the history and another data which uh, talks about the coal lignite growth uh, versus the re growth where if you really look at the last decade growth and the coal lignite power projects grew at around 9% whereas the re power projects had a cagr almost of uh, 60 uh, no sorry uh, we achieved uh, 19% uh, growth have we had attained uh where we were in 2010 to 16 gigawatts and we are today are at around 88 gigawatts considering the projected re targets as we all speak about an interim target of 2022 and then an enhanced target uh, much enhanced targets uh, during the decade uh we feel and everybody is the numbers are clear that there is an uh, there is an absolutely more than 16 17% compounded annual growth is required during the recent 6 or 7 months of covid we still see that uh, in spite of the pandemic situation all across the country the renewable energy penetration has not lost its scale you know the, in fact the renewable energy pen penetration in the grid has increased from where it was at 9% 910% close to around 12% coming back to the progress of re uh, from our end and from our sekhi and other psus uh we see the different business models being evolved 24 by 7 power peaking power hybrid power round the clock power and the recent trends that we received we have been uh, receiving in fact first was the rtc bid which uh, closed at 2.9 rupees uh, per kilowatt hour which is around 3.8 cents and uh, if you look at the latest auction where the record break tariff was achieved around 2.36 uh, which is uh, again close to 3 cents now what what actually is this happening is i think there is a lot of institutional capital that is supporting and that's what we saw in the uh, recent sekhi uh, uh, tender which achieved this result so there is a capital availability is absolutely there now mainstream re renewables is a key component of india's development vision 2030 several steps in the energy space have been taken and a clear road map for upcoming areas including storage grid augmentation to absorb increasing share of renewables and also we would have to we'll like to consider offshore wind as well so the the intent is very clear now this transition which represents the efforts undertaken and results that have been achieved on re expansion and energy efficiency is the basis for a clean secure and affordable energy supply uh, which is essential for not only everything but as a global community it is required so moving forward i think the uh, there is a national infrastructure plan that everybody is uh, the, do the document is in a public domain which talks of almost 929500 crores of investment that are uh, required in the re sector over the next 5 years and this talks about 5 years which is almost us dollar 123 billion and further when we talk of 450 gigawatts and achieving a four fold increase in capacity over this decade will require the roll out of renewable energy technologies of all across all sectors with power buildings industry agriculture transport every, everything re will have to play its main uh, role and under the both the centralized option and the decentralized energy models as well in the full spectrum of renewable energy technologies will need to be deployed with the availability of this strong policy support from the government of india what we now need is the availability of local capital to finance renewable energy that will play a very crucial role in driving down the financing cost and helping to build bankable projects pipelines whether it's solar whether it's wind and other re technology projects as the market expands i think there is a need to develop refinancing models that can expand the investor base for renewable and assets and free up project capital for the development of these new projects 
mobilizing both domestic and foreign uh, sources of private capital particularly particularly among institutional investors i think is needed to fill the financial gap we will have to look at the different models different de-risking instruments transaction enablers innovative financial structures that will unlock finance for investment into re projects and i keep talking with my colleague who is who is one of the panelists or with uh, chintan who, who represents serida and uh, this is the talk about how to bring in innovation in this business models of finance that are going to drive the re sector which is a key component for our re vision uh, to be met we also need to differentiate between mature technology which is today i think wind and solar is definitely a mature technology and also have those those technologies which will require some handhold for a some period of time and therefore that differentiation from the lending perspective from the availability of green capital perspective may also be required uh, refinancing models as i mentioned such as asset backed securities to attract private investors and innovative structures that could assess debt markets uh, and provide investment vehicles at a scale necessary to facilitate investment from institutional investors is what i feel would be really required for uh, the growth of our in india and for those new technologies which we keep and i i i am sure i think when we talk of new uh, even though battery is not that new for the global community but for yes for an indian perspective we still have uh, we are not really launched that aggressiveness into the storage market which eventually will have to come and obviously the the new baby which we talk about is hydrogen and all this would require a a, a huge backup a huge support from the financial markets in in actually differentiating between what is new and what is really a mature so for new technologies the focus should be on optimizing this limited public finances and development finance to help leverage the private sector fund financing uh, and create models that can be used to create early market for this nascent technology so i think uh, that, that i would be very keen to you know i, I had some discussions with mahu about uh, her her project and what are you going to really uh, do today uh, very keen to be a part of this i think cpi mnre and cpi have a long relationship there are certain key projects that we uh, jointly have been doing financing and certain uh, especially in the decentralized sector and uh, a uh, few of you who are very familiar today are uh, all aware of this uh, certain key initiatives will also have to be taken further there is no end to innovation and therefore whether it's technology innovation or financing innovation innovation will continue and therefore our relationship with you all will have to you all uh, get on to these such models yeah, bring in brainstorming and create a new a uh, niche market for to, en to enable uh, we achieve uh, what we intend to do uh, it's a huge target but nevertheless Uh, the intent is very clear the intent is very positive and with uh, together as a team let's work to achieve that thank you mova and look forward to the panel session as we as we progress during the webinar thank you ladies and gentlemen thank you dinesh thank you for that those are very very kind words you had exactly all the right things that we have been thinking of and it's really really refreshing and very very welcome um that you also drawn out some of the key areas that are needed for the sector going forward so thank you very much for that and thank you for being uh, so forthcoming i'll ask jolly to present the document now and present the findings and we'll then just launch into uh, into a discussion jolly uh, jolly on yours i'm going to just mute myself yes um thank you great uh i hope everybody can see the screen just checking up yes okay great uh thank you mawa thank you uh, dinesh sir and thank you anshu and thank you everybody for joining um good evening everybody um uh, my name is jolly sinha i have been managing the project uh, for the past one year and uh, uh, on the behalf of the team i'm delighted to present these findings with you should you have any questions during the course of the presentation please uh, uh, put them on the chat box on the right we will collate and organize them um, and uh, get to the answers um, so uh, shortly after the panel discussion So landscape of climate uh, green finance is an unprecedented study undertaken by CPI along with Shakti Sustainable Foundation 
to track uh, to essentially track the nature and quantum of green finance flows through the economy between fiscal years 2016 and 18. Uh, it is retrospective nature because um, we wanted to create um, an initial baseline on which uh, against which to measure our progress. Uh, we started out with the aim of understanding green flows at the national and subnational levels, as well as to identify uh, any gaps uh, through the value chain of green financing. Uh, and in the process, we have produced a detailed Sankey diagram and a comprehensive report, which essentially presents a snapshot of the market in India. I will quickly take you through the scope of this exercise. So due to an unavailability of a standardized green taxonomy, our uh, typology has been aligned with the one discussed in the findings of the green finance stocks taxonomy, the which that Mahua mentioned earlier, and the link is there in the chat box. Thanks, Krista, for that, uh, which was developed by CPI and C Kinetics. The time frame of the study spans, like I mentioned, 20, fiscal years 2017 and 18. That is two years. In this particular phase, we have included the three key sectors, uh, which, uh, which include power generation, energy efficiency, transmission, and sustainable transport, transportation across the three instruments, namely debt, equity, and grant. This, uh, it is important to note here that the scope of the accounting is uh, based on disbursement of flows as opposed to commitments or pledges. Um, you, uh, for more information, you can please check out our methodology document, which is the background paper. We have also published that details our accounting procedures. Um, let's talk a little about the Sankey diagram, which is the primary output of the exercise. It uh, essentially visualizes our finding in a neat and succinct manner. Here it is. Um, our major finding and the overarching uh, number in this report is 248,000 crores, which is approximately equivalent to 38 billion USD, which is the total dragged green finance that flowed through the economy in the, uh, in the given two years. So from left to right, if you see the tentacles, they will represent the flow of the money from sources to sectors and subsectors via these three instruments. Uh, to give you more context on this number, the 248,000 crores represent approximately 1% of the total GDP between the two years and uh, around 10% of net new investments into the country. Uh, I will explain a little bit on each of these columns. Firstly, the sources that we have included span across domestic, international, private and public. The first three being government, PSU and uh, DFIs being on the public side of things. Then there is philanthropy, project developers, banks, residential and institutional, which uh, take up the private space. Uh, uh, in terms of sectors, uh, as is evident and is not surprising, the largest source of financing was commercial banks via debt and uh, power generation was the sector that attracted the lion's share of financing, which was largely, of course, driven by solar and wind. Uh, while transportation, uh, still a nascent industry during that time, was, driven by uh, was also driven by capital expenditure into mass rapid transportation. Uh, but transmission and energy efficiency projects also followed very closely with major financing flowing into smart grids and uh, green energy corridors. A quick point of information on this is that the unknown uh, category in instruments basically encompasses all the uh, transactions that could not be attributed to one of these instruments. And uh, the multiple uses category in the subsectors essentially talks about uh, all the finances that uh, was not directly flowing into one particular set of sectors, but into many, such as uh, research and policy uh, initiatives. Uh, in the subsequent slides, we will discuss each of these columns in much more detail. So, as you can see on uh, in the graph on the left, the domestically raised finances tower over the international money for the two track years with private actors actually contributing the largest share of uh, the finance. Uh, now, again, uh, like I mentioned, commercial bank represent the major chunk of the pie of the total tracked investments, uh, followed by uh, government budgets that we looked at and some investments by the PSUs under uh, Ministry of Power. 
We have also done a brief analysis on instrument, which represents the second column of Hasanki. Uh, a major finding was that debt through project or corporate finance is the largest instrument used while channeling of green finance. So uh, while in the report we acknowledge a need for an effective mix of instruments and moving from banks to capital markets, it lies uh, outside the scope of our current exercise, but CPI has produced um, uh, reports on this uh, topic, which uh, you can check out. And we will uh, do this uh, a similar analysis in our subsequent phases. When, uh, the third column of Sankey re represents uh, sectors, uh, while due to the differences in methodology, we will refrain from any sectoral comparisons right now. It will be beneficial to discuss them individually. In the power generation sector, predictably, solar remains the large, highest grossing sector followed by wind generation. Um, it is interesting to note that, and also as Dinesh sir mentioned, that um, these uh, this increase is actually driven by real capacity additions uh, and not cost additions because these were the two years of record low tariffs and interest rates. Uh, so this was an important um, observation. In the second sector, namely power transmission and energy efficiency, we highlight a key role of the public sector undertaking, especially Bureau of Energy Efficiency and ESL, while uh, 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 in, in this graph, you can actually see that while some uh, money has been invested into uh, green energy corridors and smart grids, there are sectors like green buildings that are still quite uh, underdeveloped and need, uh, need significant investments. Uh, in the graph, we can uh, observe that while uh, private financing at times remains elusive and difficult to track in the energy efficient setup, especially the industrial part of it, uh, there are significant investments that were made by the public sector, um, namely the PSUs and the budgets and international organizations as well. When we uh, talk about sustainable transportation, as you'd be aware, 16 and 17 were largely uh, very former, although very formative years for transportation, still quite, um, uh, 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 you know, still quite in, on the policy formulation side, uh, which is why only 12% of the total track green investments could be attributed to sustainable transportation. Uh, which was largely also driven by three-wheeler uh, rickshaw sales and um, MRTS investments actually, which represent a one-time fixed cost and may not constitute a trend. Basis these data points and analysis, we have observed certain uh, trends and key observations in the report. And one of our key uh, objective uh, was to identify and assess any uh, barriers, gaps, and opportunities in measurement and tracking of green flows in the country. Uh, firstly, a lack, a significant lack of harmon harmonized greens uh, taxonomy and the non-standardized reporting of data uh, made it extremely difficult for us to tag budget lines and projects, it, and it often makes it quite arbitrary and uh, uh, discretionary to the user. Secondly, there are significantly large variations in the granularity and the format of the budget uh, categorization of data at different levels of uh, administrative reporting, which uh, actually makes the collation of such green uh, of climate data quite uh, not only quite cumbersome, but also uh, prone to double counting. So while in our methodology, we have attempted to circumvent some of these challenges, uh, it still needs to go a long way before it becomes sophisticated enough so that we can plug all the loopholes uh, and actually track it efficiently. Apart from uh, refining the accounting and data collection procedure, as I just mentioned, the next step of the study will also include the team uh, designing a framework for the online portal for measurement and reporting of this data. And the main exercise uh, called the climate budget tagging that I want to discuss about will involve uh, uh, the team working towards application of climate mainstreaming in the budgetary processes. Um, I just wanted to run you quickly. So this is one of the examples that we actually came across. This is the Tamil Nadu annual state budget and I will explain the problem. 
uh, is that uh, these rupees are given in thousands. This is against the 2810 budget code, which, refers, which, uh, which represents the new and renewable energy. These rupees are in thousands and this figure here is clearly inaccurate. This is from the 1718 annual budget of the state. Um, and there are other issues with the same. There are, there's limited granularity. There is no information on use of proceeds. And this is what we really want to, uh, uh, you know, amend in our subsequent phases. Uh, it means that we want a climate-based assessment of budgets and want to incorporate a green perspective at all levels of the government. Uh, a, a something like this, a, structure, a structured budget uh, for climate, very similar to the gender budgeting that we currently perform, uh, will, should essentially inform its readers of uh, the relevant ministry, the implementing agency, the, uh, the use of proceeds, objectives of the state scheme uh, and also the rationale for tagging it as green. Uh, well, we still have a long way to go before this is actualized, um, but the question remains that how do we plug these uh, gaps in information and address these challenges with respect to the public accounting uh, framework. So thank you. It was really, uh, it was a pleasure discussing this with you and for any questions, uh, please Put it in the box on the right. We will get to that shortly. Um, I will hand it back to Mahua now. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Jolly, and thank you for the team. It's so good to see uh, this report come to fruition. It's uh, it's been nothing short of a challenge, and Jolly has been Jolly and team have been absolutely fantastic, keeping up with patients and trying to uh, sort through all of the data. As you can imagine, the, doing something the first time around is. Uh, can be anything between extra exhilarating to thankless. So thank you very much also to, to you and uh, for, for putting this all together so nicely. Let me just move to uh, the panel. Uh, there's a, I have, we've, we've scheduled some questions. Unfortunately, Shamila had to leave. Uh, Shamila Chavali has been, uh, she's, uh, she has been extremely helpful uh, to us across this, this last year that we've done this work. This climate budgeting um, idea slash challenge slash thing that we that Jolly just presented, we have discussed this with Shamila many times over. It's given us a lot of guidance uh, coming from the outside to understand how budgets work inside the government of India can be, um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. And Shamila has been really, really uh, helpful. Unfortunately, she had to head off to another uh, event. So let me just move. Um, to the panel, I've taken note of uh, of some of the issues raised by Dinesh and Anshu as well. Um, let's start with Balwant. And I wanted to ask Balwant uh, that Balwant, you, you're in the, let's say you are the crossroads of demand and supply of green finance, meaning you're right in the center, you deal with the technical issues, you deal with daily issues, you deal with policy and their implications on just doing business. Um, and in your experience, your career experience and in your more recent experience, what would be the biggest pain points? So or what are the sectors in your view that need to receive much more money and much more green, green money? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Mohan. Uh, also, I would like to congratulate the entire CPI team for this uh, landmark effort. It has come out uh, really, really well. Uh, also, you know, uh, I hope the further work in terms of uh, extension also takes place uh, with the same rigor. Uh, having said that, coming back to Mohan's question, uh, obviously, as Anshu said, a lot of green finance money, majority of it has gone to two sectors, solar and wind. That, that is a clean energy or within the clean energies. Power generation, within power generation, a lot of money has gone to wind and solar. However, where do we need money moving forward? Uh, Dinesh has made my task reasonably easy by actually spelling out the sectors for the government. But I also would like to focus on one more point. One is certainly uh, that is distributed renewable sector. Today, what we are seeing is that large number, large quantum of money is moving into the Seki-based project, 
200, 250 megawatt large project. In fact, yesterday we saw announcement by the government about 41,000 megawatt large park, Ari Park in Kutch in Gujarat. So these are the very large projects which would require large uh, uh, green energy corridors of the investment in transmission. But real benefit of the renewable energy lies into distributed. The projects connected at 33 kV, projects connected at 11 kV, also into the rooftop sector. So moving forward, one of the first sectors where there should be investment, there, where there should be a lot of green finance is in this sector that is a distributed renewable energy sector, both, and I'm going to say distributed renewable energy, not only rooftop, but also distributed and connected at 33 kV, 11 kV at uh, the distribution network. So this is the one sector that would be uh, there where the investment would be required. The second sector, energy storage, what our analysis in the recent past has shown is there is a huge value to storage, not connected with the large renewable energy projects, but to the distribution network, both in terms of uh, the participation into ancillary market or a DSM management, but also in terms of capex deferral, energy arbitrage uh, for the for the distribution companies to be able to supply very reliable power. Uh, to the consumers of the, of the distribution company. So the second area from my point of view would be the investments in storage and MNRE should not only take necessary initiatives for the regulatory and policy, but also on the financing side of the, uh, of the, of the storage. The third area, the technology divestment, di diversity. We have wind projects coming up, but land is obviously a challenge. Uh, Dinesh mentioned about MNRE's priority in terms of uh, in terms of uh, offshore wind. I think that is the third area of investment uh, that would be required. The other areas like you know hydrogen are still in my view a little distant. The immediate future, immediate next to three to five years, these are the three areas where there is a lot of investment that should be uh, that should be done. Back to you, Mawa. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Palwan. Actually, you've raised a number of points that very nicely just lead into a question I had for Govin. Last something I want to leave uh, with uh, Dinesh and perhaps even later with Chintan. So let me first ask uh, uh, Govin, who is on, let's say he's on the fundraising side now, and you're saying that more green money needs to go into distributed renewables in the interest of the audience is 33 kVA kind of projects are ones right at um, by all traditional definitions these are um, riskier in the sense that they're further away from the grid they tend to be small they have these more traditionalistic uh, uh, criteria around risk so if you in your if you are raising money and now that you are in the business of raising money and you'd like to put out this, this money uh, into projects such as distributed renewables or others, how would you incentivize, I mean, who would you incentivize and how would you incentivize the investee companies or the beneficiaries uh, to make the switch into greener or different types of projects would in would in other way uh, in other words with your how would you get your capital to incentivize them yeah thank you uh, mahua first of all for uh, inviting me to this panel and also for a excellent report that you've all come up with and a very timely one at that uh, at eq the sense that we have is that there is already a fair amount of money obviously not enough going into the grid scale renewables of space and much of our focus has been on areas like the distributed rooftop solar, uh, other forms of energy efficiency, green buildings, uh, transportation, uh, base to energy and the like. Now to respond to your question, people will borrow only if you know, the borrowing terms are reasonably fair and people also lend only if there is a degree of risk mitigation. Uh, if I take a couple of examples, you take say rooftop solar for instance, one of the problems is uh, needs to be addressed by just aggregating it in some way so that uh, both the cost of reaching out to the uh, customer is slightly less 
and also potentially the simply the statistical benefits of aggregated lending can sometimes be uh, can be there which enables a more attractive sort of cost at which you lend uh, so you need to then partner with sort of original equipment manufacturers you need to partner with maybe the lnts or the thermaxes or the tata power, uh, power solar of the world whoever it is who can enable you to reach the the market for distribution uh, and uh, you know make it easier for a lender to reach out it, in that way you sort of incentivize them simply by giving them a better rate i think the second piece of course is uh, are you able to pull together interesting first class kind of structures which can help support this market i mean some work has been done there but i think there needs to be a lot more to again uh, uh, help lenders feel confident when they're dealing with these kinds of, uh, you know, not very large loans. Uh, thirdly, of course, uh, and more conventionally, uh, you can incentivize them through, through let's say, subventions and clawbacks of interest, which they've already paid you uh, if certain targets get achieved. But that, you know, uh, comes... Want interns? With, your pardon? Uh, which I think comes to the point that we made earlier, uh, which is that it needs measurement to be there, uh, which otherwise, uh, you know, hasn't, has been lacking in many of these entities. So these are, you know, three or four different ways in which we would uh, incentivize borrowers. It's not easy to do. Very large banking institutions don't necessarily uh, either have the bandwidth or the desire to sort of get into these kinds of partnerships and arrangements. Uh, for loans which may be, uh, you know, a few lakhs or a few crores, they are much more comfortable, I guess, lending, you know, a hundred million dollars for 10 years. Thanks, uh, Govind. I, okay, you're still there. Thank you for that, Govind. I must assure the panel that uh, this was not scripted because some of the things that, you're, that you raised were in fact what I had uh, in mind to ask Shloka, uh, and in fact, even Anshu, uh, given that he's in that role now. So philanthropy, you mentioned risk mitigation, and we need things like more, more uh, instruments, first loss and things like that. I think the really the elephant in the room in most conversations at least I've been in is, as far as India is concerned, the mounting discount payment risk is, is continues to be a really big problem. So let me ask, Shloka, who uh, in the last one year, Shloka, and especially in the last six, seven months, a lot of philanthropy money, appear, philanthropy plus aid in particular, appears to have diverted towards immediate COVID relief. Now that has stressed a number of things that were otherwise scheduled. But going forward, do you see uh, the appetite amongst the philanthropies that you deal with, or even otherwise, to take more of an active participation as risk capital, meaning will philanthropy money get involved in eating some of this risk that, that Govind talked about? Um, Anshu, I realized that you know, this was not perhaps what Shakti had contemplated at the time of setting up, but is there something that you think, um, is this an area that you think philanthropy can or should participate in? Well, that for me or yeah. Anshu? I, I think. Okay. You uh, firstly. Shuka. Okay. Um, so, firstly, like, congratulations. Um, the report is just such a much needed sort of foundational piece of um, really infrastructure. And it's so fantastic that you guys have managed to bring this out in COVID times. Um, I can't imagine the sort of difficulties you've had to go through, but. Huge, huge kudos to you guys, and thank you for doing that, because um, it makes all of our jobs much easier. Um, so just quickly before I sort of you know, delve into your question, um, to tell you guys a little bit about the India Climate Collaborative. Um, you know, essentially, we are a collaborative platform that convenes business, philanthropy, and civil society uh, for an India-led, India-focused collective response to the climate crisis. Um, so our mission is really to amplify the power of philanthropy and business, and we're committed, of course, to collaborative action. Uh, we're a team of researchers, facilitators, strategists, grant makers, um, and we help funders invest in effective climate strategies across India. 
So we listen and work closely with frontline organizations around the country as well as globally. We have a partner network of over you know, 100 plus organizations that seek to advance climate solutions in India and across the world. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question because um, I think at this time, an important framing here, especially for India, is going to be um, to think of recovery in our green goals or a sustainable future really as a continuum, not isolated from each other. So for me, you know, when we talk about things like, for instance, you know, jumpstarting the decade of action, it's really about transitioning who we are the very foundations of us as a country. We've been forced into this transitional phase due to this pandemic uh, and how we choose to come out of it. What are the decisions that we want to lead with? It's, it's really imperative, for instance, that we don't lock ourselves into a high carbon future and rather we focus on building a low carbon sustainable future instead. And it actually reminds me of a news report that I read recently. Um, as part of a new development plan for Varda in the 150th year of Mahatma Gandhi's birth, roads are being constructed and widened all over Vardha and they're cutting hundreds of trees to widen the road to Gandhi's old ashram. This seems like too much irony even for 2020. So how do we move sustainability to the front and you know what do I mean by that? So for instance climate finance just needs to be mainstream finance. You know sustainability actions um, are currently grant funded. They just need to be funded. So we need to change the paradigm of sustainability itself from a niche sector into one that's far more mainstream. And I think, you know, all of my panelists have brought this up today uh, with regards to renewable energy. If you look at renewable energy, you know, if Crystal had rated the, the energy sector 15 years ago, it would have been very, very risky. However, you know, Bloomberg's just recently rated India as the most attractive RE market globally. So in terms of directions of where we should go, um, you know, there are a number of those and, and technical support today is fortunately available. You know, Terry came out with a recent discussion paper on a fiscally responsible green stimulus and they made some great points on sectors that are really primed for green recovery investments, you know, from EVs to rural energy to MSMEs to energy storage. Um, CEW also came out with a great report recently, uh, you know, and their preliminary calculations show that I think a cumulative amount of over 5,200 crores um, from, from 20, uh, 2021 to 2028 could actually facilitate an economically viable market for onshore wind and solar PV by 2030, which would create another half million jobs. So it's, you know, we're seeing a lot of movement around um, the possibility for economic growth and recovery with regards to sustainable outcomes. Um, it's a good time to promote domestic solar manufacturing. Um, you know, innovations in distributed re renewable energy can also greatly enhance grid reliability, but they do require concerted policy, regulatory, business and technological interventions. Um, rural economic resilience is also another critical area of concern right now. Uh, you could look at renewable energy powered or energy efficient solutions such as solar powered looms, coal storage, mills, food processors, all of these can transform energy access from a consumption paradigm to a real economic driver. Um, another great example is that India could also ensure universal rural health care through a sustainable energy path. So the recommendations really are you know, quite vast, they're available. What we need to really focus on next is how these are actually embedded into policy and investments. And this is going to require a lot of coordination on a lot of fronts from businesses to civil society organizations, to think tanks, to the finance sector, as well as alignment between the development and climate community to deliver these key signals to government. So our role um, at the ICC and the role of philanthropy really is to support how the government thinks of the new India. We do have to help them give, this, give them this vision for the future for that new India. We've made some very globally ambitious commitments um, and we need to start thinking about whether or not we can expand that, you know, beyond, beyond renewable energy to other subsectors such as waste, recycling, electric mobility. There's a lot of scope here um, to move beyond where we currently are. Back to you, Mahua. Thanks for that, Shoka. Uh, I will come back uh, to, to this point because uh, I've also asked Anshu as well. But let me just go through the rest of the panel because there are, these questions are all kind of leading into, into each other. Jintan, uh, earlier in the conversation, I think, um, well, Dinesh, I think, brought it up. And then this issue of risk and the use of public money and public capital has, was also raised by, uh, by Govind. 
So given your, just your experience, you know, your experience back from your Suzlon days to your experience now at Ereda and your experience now with the government, where do you see, do, are you seeing, especially perhaps in post-COVID or even otherwise, are you seeing, um, a, 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 has the relationship between public and private changed in any way? Or do you see public finance playing a slightly different role? Um, Balwant mentioned, also mentioned that some of the most sort of frontier areas that need to be financed need government assistance. And I think somebody said, well, it's, it's not just regulatory and policy, but also um, financial support. Can you, can you comment on that based on what you're seeing <clears throat> and especially on these, uh, the areas that need uh, financing? So, uh, first of all, it's a, it was a nice presentation, Jolly. Uh, the Sankey diagram was good. Uh, but I would like to have a small comment on the Sankey diagram. Uh, if you can also go to the level two, like for example, a lot of public banks did raise bonds in the global market and this money has got into renewables. So you need to have essentially underlined where the bond market has helped in this. Apart from this, also a lot of corporate people have got to the bond markets after the public, uh, after drawing money from the bank, and after the project have been stabilized, they've been raising bonds and replacing banks money with bond money. So I think that is something which you may do it later, but that's something which is very important. Uh, the reason being that when we are having this big target of 125 gigawatt and a larger target of 450 gigawatt, and uh, obviously you don't have so much of public money available. So you need to somehow unlock the domestic capital and international capital. Uh, that means you create a bond market. Uh, that's something which is very important and the and the and the and the large public funds can be essentially be rotated uh, money gets released goes back to again uh, uh, plow back into the construction capital as well as stabilization capital because once a project is stabilized people would definitely like to go to the bond market and that in that is the way forward that's what's happening globally uh, but uh, having said that when we talk about wind and solar what is important to know is uh, the basic model of wind and solar even before the bidding started off uh, was quite robust and it was sustainable and what the bidding did it just made it scalable so you already had the right elements to make it scalable and it was sustainable now that is something which is very important for any financing method now if you're talking about distributed generation uh, is distributed generation the current model which has been pursued is it sustainable is it scalable is a big question that we need to answer if it is sustainable, if it is uh, uh, it's acceptable, then definitely it is scalable. Now, unless you don't correct these basic parameters for a banker or for a lending institution, uh, you'll have problems in make it scalable. Uh, that's where we uh, we think that uh, a lot of NBFs and MFIs have a role to play to make it sustainable so that it can be scalable later. So uh, that's what uh, uh, that we're, what we are doing right now is trying to work out different models uh, for distributed generation to make it sustainable first and make it and you have a very different appraisal methodology for this distributed generation. Uh, if you're going to use the same uh, appraisal methodology that you utilize for a 250 megawatt wind or a solar project, uh, you'll have a problem. Any lender would have a problem. So you need to change the appraisal methodology, you change the risk association. Now, for example, when you're looking at rating itself, uh, for a distributed generation, where do you get the rating from? Bulk of the people have never borrowed in their life. If you haven't borrowed in their life, you don't have a rating. You don't have a civil record. Now, how do you rate such people? How do you create a credit record for those people? Now, that's a major challenge for any uh, commercial lender or to that matter, any conventional lender. That's where the role of an MFI or an NBFC comes into picture so that because their understanding and perception of risk is different. Uh, than a lender, a normal lender which has got lots of money. So this is something that we need to work upon and I think everybody is trying to sort out this uh, this particular thing and trying to uh, essentially harmonize it so that it becomes universal, it becomes uh, uh, standardized. But yes, uh, uh, one thing that always comes to our mind is uh, when you're looking at such risky portfolios to be created, uh, partial risk guarantee fund is something which is very, very important for any lender to get into it because it's a chicken and egg issue that getting into a lending part, either it is energy efficiency or a distributed generation 
or, or even decentralized generation. The, the risk perception for any lender is pretty high. That's where I think there are places where partial risk guarantee funds are available and that is essentially creating a confidence in a lender and if the project fails or something fails because you're not able to capture the right appraisal, uh, you covered. Uh, so it essentially gives hope to a lender. But this, but the problem with the partial risk guarantee fund is then uh, once you're getting into it, every lender would like to continue with the partial risk guarantee fund. Uh, that's where the problem is. So you need to still create a framework, uh, as I said again, which is sustainable, and then you can make it scalable. Mm -hmm. I think I tried to add this. Yeah, something. you have. Uh, thank you for that, Tintin. I think all of you have raised some really, really important uh, points and you know, things that we've got to capture. I'm also really happy you've raised this point about not getting addicted to, to risk mitigation. I know we don't have too many of these instruments, but I also know from other markets I've worked in where there are these risk mitigation instruments, partial risk guarantee and so on. And, you know, there is a, a slight habit of addiction, which is quite difficult to wean off. Let me ask uh, Darshan. Uh, just, Darshan, are you, are you there? I saw Darshan. But... I am. Ah, oh, here. Hi, you. Hi, Darshan. Hi. So I think I'm going to ask you a question that I suspect everybody asks you and every panel you are on. Uh, how do we pull all of this together? Or does it all fit vis-a-vis -vis COP26? I know you're extremely involved in that preparation. So from where you sit, Uh, what would your priorities be vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, let's say, a relationship with India or otherwise? Sure. <clears throat> Happy to talk to you a bit of that. Uh, yes, it is a question that comes up often. Can I just start by saying thank you very much for the invitation? It's such a pleasure and privilege to join my colleagues in India. I, I think the presentation is excellent. We've done a lot of work. I've worked with CPI over probably the better part of a decade. Um, having that clarity of analysis is so useful in terms of determining where best we can move forward. So having said that, I just, uh, and I hope you can hear me, uh, Ma, let me know if there are any problems with the sound. But uh, essentially our focus, right, we all thought we would be doing this for this November. Obviously given the pandemic, this has shifted to November 2021. It is a critical COP. I mean, they all are, but obviously this one was planned five years on from Paris. It will take place six years on. It is the moment that we can come back as a globe, as a planet, and say, this is what increased ambition does look like from NDCs. This is what each country's effort to bring their best, um, their best game, if you like, forward in this critical space uh, is beginning to come together collectively. So I think for us, that's the number one priority is to ensure that those state-led NDCs are of the highest ambition uh, as possible. Now, the timeline for that is meant to be by the end of this year. Uh, we're very keen to do our own bit in that and make sure that the UK uh, demonstrates from, a, from our own perspective that this is uh, the level of ambition that we're willing to set. I hope we have a clear news to share on that before the end of the year. And we look to our key allies and key partners in this space to also come forward with equivalent high ambition NDCs. The next thing I would mention is obviously there is the discussion around the 100 billion in the negotiations. That is a key aspect of making sure that we have a successful negotiated outcome. We need to be able to demonstrate as in the, in, the, in the negotiations that the trajectory towards that flow of capital from um, countries to emerging markets is continuing and is uh, reaching the commitments that were made in Paris. So that's a key, key and very important component of it. That depends a little on donor finance commitments and ensuring that those who are contributing through ODA structures and it's notable from the survey, the role of MDBs, DFIs, as well as international finance. But I thought it was quite interesting in the uh, numbers that you shared, the, the relatively small role of international finance, which I think is absolutely right for a, a, a market the size of India's. So that's, that's a key piece. Then there is um, on the private finance side, the determination to build increase transparency and disclosure into all private or professional financial decisions that are taking place. So I think those are some of our core aims. 
how is it all coming together? I think they, we have 15 months. There's some key moments between now and then. There are the annuals, there's the multilateral mechanisms, but there are also the private finance moments when uh, op there's opportunity for people to come together and say, actually, you know, states are doing one thing, but private financial institutions, banks, asset owners, asset managers, pension funds across the globe are beginning to take this uh, as seriously as we, we think is appropriate. So I, I, I will stop there, Ma, so I'm happy to respond to other questions. But those are the types of things that uh, we, we are keen to push for. And the, this conversation has been very helpful in understanding better the Indian context. Sure, thank you for that, Arshan. Thank you. We've done, uh, you know, this panel has already raised all of the, uh, let's say, the hottest issues and the most burning issues uh, right now. I did want to call, call on a couple of um, people because there's some topics that I wanted to explore a little bit more. If I can go back to Anshu, a number of people raised this issue of risk and uh, the ability, the need to have more risk instruments out there. Um, Chintan made some really good points about we just we need to deepen our domestic capital markets, and it is true we don't have as many differentiated debt sort of instruments. Uh, one of the things that came up many times as we were building out this report and building out the study is questions especially the advisory group saying how what does the the second layer of market look like meaning what are our financial structures is there a change from doing a 3070 gearing debt equity or is it that people have other sorts of financial structures that they're using that is allowing such a, it was in the context of such aggressive bidding for renewables so does it mean that our financial markets are getting to the next level of sophistication. So there's a number of things in that I wanted to discuss with you. So if I can go to Anshu first, perhaps, and maybe then Dinesh, to ask from your, from where you sit, is this something you think uh, can be explored? And we, is, this a, is this a priority that you can take forward? Where does, is there, do you foresee philanthropy playing a role uh, in, in what I would call the next generation of green finance. So now, if I understand your question correctly, uh, uh, you, you want to explore the role of philanthropy in mitigating risk in some of these investments and this, in these projects. Is that what that's you're referring correct. to? Yeah, that's correct. Anshu. Uh, you know, my my initial thoughts would be that uh, that's not uh, uh, has been an area of focus of philanthropy, um, and the reasons are obvious because uh, philanthropic support has mainly been into uh, policy support and designing the overall framework for uh, uh, deployment of RE and other clean technologies. Where philanthropic money has actually gone in is in the implementation type projects. That is for rural electrification or small uh, off-grid electrification, that's where direct philanthropic money has gone in. But the, the kind of uh, interventions you are seeking for that, uh, uh, there are two reasons. One, the quantum of philanthropic money is just, I would say a drop in the ocean compared to what is required at the scale given our country's uh, aspirations. And B, philanthropic donors would argue that, well, that's not really our mandate because financial institutions uh, are there specifically for this purpose. So uh, philanthropic money would be perhaps best spent in overall design of framework to support policy than actually mitigating risks uh, in specific projects. That would be my initial comments. Thank you for that, Anshu. Let me ask um, Dinesh also to come in on some of the comments that Chintan had made in terms of um, do you what needs to change? You know, Chintan also brought up this idea of sometimes our paradigm for risk assessment is not perhaps suited uh, for the kinds of areas we want to move money into. Uh, as far as 
you're sitting and as far as from, from where you're sitting, where does this sit vis-a-vis -vis again MNRE priorities or even otherwise, do you agree? Thanks, Mova, and uh, I think that has been a long debate uh, over the years about mm. the risk taking ability of uh, each stakeholder within the, uh, the within the broader framework of RE. You know, it starts from the lenders, the developers, the regulators, the policymakers, the off takers. So the 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 risk is all the risk is always there. Now, who takes the maximum out of that is always uh, being debated, and every time we come across. Uh, everybody talks looking at the government and then uh, government has a limited uh, means to really support uh, such risk as it as we move forward and initially of course uh, the, there has been a support but of late i think my personal uh, uh, thought process is that uh, the projects and i, I and as i met uh, as i mentioned in the earlier uh, uh, in my opening remarks also that the, the mature technologies, of course, has to be differentiated uh, from the new technologies. And where it comes, obviously, uh, in my earlier role, when I was in the, uh, the developer role, I found it really difficult really to get uh, project non-recourse finance. And uh, that was really a challenge in 2010, 2011, when we are going to the lenders and really at the, on the merit of the project. And when I talk on merit of the project is, absolutely a fully due diligence done uh, risk assessed project. In spite of that, it, it was so difficult to get a 100% non-recourse project financing. But over the years from, you know, as we have crossed a decade from which I mentioned of 2010-11, uh, more maturity has come in the lending sector. But still, I would suggest that uh, I, I still see that uh, there is a little void in that. And the risk, uh, uh, the, the risk ability of the lender still needs to be increased. Uh, so by saying that, and just to answer your question, I see we need to, a lot of education needs to be required. Uh, the Indian developers see a risk from all aspects, whether it's resource, land, offtake, project execution, uh, and there are so many risk elements involved. So from our end, what we are trying to evolve and develop is slightly de-risk the, uh, the elements that come across the project development. And when I say that, I mean, uh, there is an assured offtake, there is a very strong PPA, there is a payment security mechanism, the offtaker is really strong in its uh, credential. So all that offtaker risk is what we at MNRE have been trying to uh, evolve and over a period of time that has been mitigated to a better extent. But still looking at the federal structure of the government of India with state, center, various entities, slight element of risk does remain. And that, that is where we all are trying to evolve. What else can we do? Uh, from the offtake perspective. From the uh, resource perspective, obviously the resource which is, but natural, it is the developer who mitigates its risk around the resource. But the other element, which is an important element is the, the situation on ground, whether it's land, whether it's related permits, approvals, how fast we can do. Uh, so there is an another thought process within MNRE. We have, we have formed uh, development cells. We have formed facilitation boards. Uh, anybody who wants to invest in this country can come up to us. We will facilitate them, get the land, earmark a project, facilitate them and take them to the state government. So all that we are trying to do at MNRE. And that is what I think uh, uh, is helping the community together now uh, to look at India as a very strong uh, supporter of RE. Uh, we at MNRE with, uh, at the highest level trying to uh, handheld uh, all the developers, whether it's into IPP or the power producer mode or into the manufacturing sector, uh, whatever best help we can provide within the framework of the uh, reg rules and regulations we are trying to do. So a uh, lot of effort is there in taking, in mitigating the risk. Now the other point which I bring in the, the equity investors or the debt institution, uh, institutions, also we will have to weigh the project on a pure technology, techno economic uh, commercial basis and see that they offer uh, a very risk mitigated finance, long term finance based on the, the credentials of the off taker, based on the credentials of the developer and obviously the policy support that the government of India is doing. So that's what I can say. Uh, that's ex Thank you for that Dinesh. I'm, I'm, you know, I must also um, commend MNRE over the years for for being extremely responsive I and mean, very quick to respond to the to the sector and that really really helps and you will appreciate that being a developer having been a developer 
the responsiveness of the ministry because at the end of the day in India and in, like, in many emerging markets, governments are still at the wheel. Um, if you look at the, you know, the fact that in our Sankey diagram, renewable energy occupies the largest space is not uh, just magic. The government has made it um, mainstream discourse. And the same thing with electric vehicles. It's a small little piece, but this is a uh, study for two years ago. So uh, I'm so, I'm, I, I, mean, I, I must commend Eminari for, uh, for keeping up with the market uh, to the best of its avail avail availability. I know many people on the, on the audience may not agree with me. Yeah, I, I know that. And uh, thanks, Mova, for that. But I think a lot of still things need to be done. And uh, I see Balwant looking at me and uh, you know saying that oh this is nothing will not a lot has to be done but obviously there has to and we I, I uh, personally and we all collectively also uh, every day evolve that uh, things has to improve and will keep on improving. Sure, um, I I want to ask um, Govin something because we've been talking about domestic markets and we uh, we've been talking about some of our financial situation in India and. You know, a lot of our discussions, and they do tend to focus around renewables. You are in the fundraising stage right now, and you're talking to a lot of investors, domestic and foreign. What are you seeing? What are, what are people saying? What's the temperature out there? You know, there is uh, obviously... Uh, if, if I ignore the the current challenge which investors generally seem to be facing because of COVID, which has put some of their thinking on hold, uh, more generally, I think there is a lot of in interest in, and uh, both in renewable, but also I think increasingly one is sensing that uh, people feel that the, uh, the opportunity for green and for the transition and for jobs and so on, would be in many other areas and I think Shloka mentioned some of those that those might be in cold chains those might be in you know HVAC and lighting related to a lot of the construction that is apparently supposed to take place and of course you know the electric transport and storage sector is something that the government has really supported and appears poised to support going ahead so I think there is a lot of interest what would of course if I look at the context of the report what would help I think is uh, a better reporting framework if they could see some of that. So I think that for those who are used to a certain level of taxonomy, I think they struggle a little bit when they speak of uh, the Indian context. Uh, some movement has happened here. So you have the business responsibility reports, which are now you know, expanded to the top thousand listed companies and all that. But I think that there's still some work to be done out there. Uh, what we are hearing from people is that Commonality of taxonomy is good, but simply greater reporting and materiality of reporting is important because there is a feeling that, look, once you start reporting on some basis, the convergence that you need to, ha uh, to do starts happening uh, over a period of time. But if you simply do not sort of articulate uh, your, uh, you know, uh, your reporting and disclosures, then it's very difficult for people to converge because what do you converge to if, you, if your reporting is inadequate? Uh, and by reporting, I think that we, uh, there are two levels of expectations. The first expectation that we see from some of these people is, has to do with, uh, I think, trying to find some degree of financial link to what are otherwise non-financial areas. So, you know, all of us in this space frequently indicate that you know, we see these investments as long-term investments uh, and companies need to start showing how those investments will pay off in the long term, in part because there are investors who are, uh, in terms of fiduciary responsibilities, obliged only to invest behind, you know, fairly high return kind of uh, I think, uh, investments. The second, of course, is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a process being a little better, which is, much as you would do with normal, you know, uh, financials, would you have a green target? Would you articulate it? And would you say whether you hit it or you missed it uh, and explain why rather than sort of simply reporting certain numbers without any sense, at least to the reader, of whether that was good or bad in your context? Oh. 
Mm. Okay. Um, go, I, 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 I appreciate um, some, in, at some level, feel your pain because the language of public and private has never really converged. Um, it's getting closer. But private companies call fundraising, fundraising. Public entities call it resource mobilization. I mean, just, just to put it in context, we are at a very yeah, base level now. So cool. um, I, I, I fully appreciate that. There is some ways to go as far as aligning reporting and aligning language is concerned. Um, I think you mentioned this. You know, can we put a financial link to non-financial indicators? I mean, we're really outside. We're really ahead of the curve right now on, on this topic. Uh, it's, you know, I'm so glad that you are doing this in India internationally. There's, a, there's the beginnings of a, of a discussion around, uh, around standardizing or at least de facto standardizing. So perhaps this is something that philanthropy can support, um, especially given what Anshu was saying that perhaps philanthropy money is maybe not so suited to take part in direct risk mitigation. Uh, I, I want to just go back to, um, to Shloka on, on the philanthropy question. Um, where do you see philanthropy money coming in? As far as, you know, there's a, there's a plethora of all sorts of risks on the table right now. They need different sorts of mitigants. I'm not seeing any more big discussions of we just need more money. Of course, we need more money in, in just green money. But we're in a second level of discussion around where we've got to plug some of these risks and things are getting a little bit more sophisticated these days. Shruk, are you there? I'm here. Oh, thanks. thanks, Mahua. Um, so I, I'm actually, I actually agree with Anshu on the fact that philanthropy, you know, isn't sort of involved in the risk mitigation piece. Um, and, you know, there's a larger story here about the fact that sort of, you know, very few philanthropies in India actually work on climate change. But I am going to sort of um, push back a little bit on Anshu, on some of Anshu's points. Um, just because the scope for philanthropy to sort of come in on risk mitigation is so vast and so huge. And there's really a crucial role for philanthropy to play over here. Um, you know, when we decided to build the ICC, the reason we, we chose to focus on philanthropies is because their mandate is to protect the most vulnerable populations. Because organizations like the Tata Trust, which incubated the ICC, they've been doing this since before independence. You know, their currency is complexity. Their mandate is to change lives for the better. Um, so philanthropy has a unique role to play in climate action because it can increase ambition, it can scale, it can innovate solutions and it can drive collaboration, which is probably the most important. So we might be a small percentage of the overall capital in the country, but we have the power to influence the rest of that capital from both the private sector as well as government. And we really see collaboration as the only way to really create change at scale. So we may invest only two crores, but we can direct over 10,000. Um, and that's really where philanthropy plays a very, very catalytic role. And there are some tremendous gaps. Uh, you know, to your point, um, finance itself, there's a big gap here in terms of access to credit that startups face. Uh, and it's further heightened, of course, right now uh, for this cohort of startups as a result of the pandemic. What we require is patient capital, we require failure money, we require attractive rates, you know, metrics and ROIs that are customized for Indian markets and ecosystems. Um, while mature startups are attracting significant capital, money is still required to help the younger ones develop their prototypes and business models. This is a huge area where philanthropy could be very, very influential. Um, another big role for philanthropy is to invest in technical assistance, you know, build capacities, reduce investment risks, for example, blended uh, investments, basically stuff that public and commercial money doesn't usually allot line items to. Um, the third thing, of course, is the policy piece. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of political uh, or policy instability in the clean energy and climate space, which is a major disincentive for investors. Uh, and philanthropy can work with policymakers and regulators to build a much more healthy uh, ecosystem around this. You know, we thematically really need a balance between um, green tech and resilience building innovations. You know, climate action in India has to balance both adaptation and mitigation. And this really requires um, the tools to build markets for rural, agricultural, as well as financial solutions. You need to create innovative as, very, as well as very sort of context-specific business models. 
that's the role of philanthropy um you know philanthropic um, interventions can lower turnaround times we can reduce transaction costs by jointly investing in you know data gaps uh, gaps in capacities last mile connection um so to give you another example philanthropy could help impact investors reduce risk perception uh, by providing better visibility of the landscape and highlighting you know shovel ready opportunities um and that's some of the work that we're doing at the icc we're really exploring the space we're trying to see how we could provide a platform for better collaborative action uh you know but we do require sector actors to tell us what's needed so by this i mean the entrepreneurs the incubators uh, impact investors we they, we need them to indicate you know what are the specific obstacles that would benefit for some from some catalytic investments uh, by philanthropy you know is it data is it market building is it more incubation capacity it's not very clear always when you're from when you're on the outside and looking in um but we are also exploring the idea of building data sets um you know for climate risks with our partners so the I, one of the big ideas that we're working on right now is the climate risk atlas uh and the idea is to really compile a variety of data points perspectives models and solutions uh to create freely available collectively owned resources to enable individuals and organizations uh to to access um uh region specific risks over very dynamic time scales um and we're hoping that you know we can serve as a meeting point for practitioners in different spaces to come together to reduce these redundancies and to fill up these blind spots back to you mahua that is amazing thank you uh, shloka i wish you all the best for this collaborative you know and you know that let me we put 5 minutes left i want to make sure we also end on time if i just go back to the panelists all of them and if i were to ask you well what is the one thing you think what's the one bug bear you have as far as green finance in india is concerned and while you think about it let me just also assure the you and the rest of the audience that questions have been coming on this chat box here on the right i think i think you can all see it they are all being answered Uh, as relevant and the ones that there are some that i have in fact asked you as well so i've taken the questions from here and shared it with the rest of the uh, the audience so i just to let you know that i'm monitoring the uh, the chat box so we all are okay so back to the panel um what's the one thing you would focus uh, on as far as increasing green finance in india is concerned one minor topic mega topic whatever you like bal balwan if i can be rude and call on balwan oh i think we've lost balwan uh rahul has raised his hand rahul you had a question uh yes thank you um uh, can folks hear me sorry Um, yes, I can. Yeah, I think they can. Yeah, Thank go you. ahead. Thank um, <clears throat> you. I'm just sort of worried because everything is treated as a supply side problem that we need more finance, and therefore that's the bottleneck. But if you go back to the Clean Energy Finance Forum report, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. A few years ago, we had put it out at the request of the minister, and lack of money shouldn't be the problem in theory. I mean, that's true of all finance when things align. so if the holy grail at that point we flagged was sovereign funds very low global debt that's floating around very cheap the three things that they need to really come into india is governance then predictability and then rates of return and we're nowhere yet on the first two enough and when we think of risk it's not just about risky capital and turnover and things like that but on the usage side the marginal cost of renewables increases as it penetrates more in a grid in a system and the marginal value declines and yet we have not adjusted to that with the instruments we have in fact the only instrument on the consumption side is ppas power purchase agreements which are very static rigid and depending on the model you're using dangerous instruments which has not been reconciled so the flag that we raised many years ago was your single biggest risk to scaling re is counterparty risk and unless we address that elephant in the room we can talk till the cows come home amongst uh, you know supply side but that's not going to be the ultimate bottleneck or we're going to face npas out of renewables 
Uh, yes, Rahul, I, <laughs> I fully agree. We don't have time to get into counterparty risk uh, for that. So I'll just treat this as a comment. Let me just make sure that if there are any other questions from anyone or if anybody Let has any last one, one question, I want to launch you. Yes, go ahead, Anshu. So, you know, I, I, I was just referring to the nice Sankey diagram which you guys put up. It was very interesting to see that flow. Uh, just a question that um, it's obvious that right now bulk of the flows are in the RE sector. But in your research, did you get a sense of what it might take to increase the financing to other sectors, non-RE? What could be the potential bottlenecks? What are what what is required to stimulate flows in those non-RE sectors? Yes, yes. Um, are you still there, Anshu? Can others hear me? Hello? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay, you're there. Okay, Anshu, yes. So I think I lost you for a second. Uh, very quickly, again, just in the interest of time, yes. Uh, yes, there are some uh, little nuggets come on, coming out of this assessment on what it would take. Uh, we can discuss this more uh, offline in detail, but just for now, um, one clear uh, policy, a policy signal is not to be underestimated. And I'm not even talking about policy uncertainty and other such things. The fact that EVs is even there as a little patch is because in these two years that this assessment was done, there was a very ambitious announcement from the center. These things are not, the effects on the financial system, the effects on the economy are not to be underestimated because a lot of investment planning starts to happen at that time. So that's just, you know, one of the, one of the things that have come up. What else do we need? There are other more detailed things that we can uh, go into. Uh, just, I'll just take two more minutes because there's some questions that are coming in right now. Darshan, um, would you like to go next? Yeah, just to come in on your point, Moha, sure. I, I think it's really important to have the domestic signals uh, from the policymaker. I think it's important to be as efficient as you can be with the limited capital, which is uh, happy to take risk off the table. So whether that's philanthropic or whether that's MDB or DFI or state government, uh, which is willing to wear the risk, we should use it as carefully as we can in the most appropriate situations, be that distributed or generation. The other thing I'd just like to say is please don't underestimate the policy signal that comes from India across the rest of the world. So I appreciate the conversation today is focused mainly domestically, but I would like to leave you with a strong sense across the whole group that what happens in India is of absolutely critical importance to what the rest of the world will do. And in part, there's a real opportunity for India to play a leadership role in this space. So uh, we would welcome, you know, any engagement on that over the coming months. Thanks. Uh, uh. Sure. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Darshan. Yes, this is this was in fact a domestic exercise, but uh, very important point. We will work with you on this one. Uh, last question from anybody before I close. Uh, Chintan said he had to leave. He had a hard stop at five thirty, uh, so he sent me his regrets. Um, anyone else? If not, then let me just take this opportunity to thank everybody. Let me thank the audience for your participation. There's just a lot of questions and comments and uh, thoughts that came in on the right-hand side here. Let me uh, thank your panelists. Uh, and let me thank my own colleagues uh, for this exercise. Let me thank our uh, communications people. I also want to thank Edelman, our communications consultant, that's really helped us put this all together in very short uh, time. And once again, thank you all for your extremely forthcoming uh, comments. Uh, we will come back to each of you. As you can imagine, this was only a, the, the start. It was in fact even retrospective. So we have no, no choice but to proceed with this. So we will come back to you for each of the things that you've raised. So thank you once again and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. 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 Stay safe. Stay healthy. <laughs>